to talk about the architect as developer, I'd first like to really uh, talk about architecture because I'm first an architect. Uh, I'm a developer because I wanted to be a certain kind of architect. I wanted to do the things that I wanted to do. And I wanted to have a greater say-so in what I did and a greater control, uh, as it were, over my own future. So I'd like to talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are now, and where I think we must go in the future. Architecture historically has been an expression or reflection of the society and culture in which it was created. That definition seems to leave us in a hell of a mess right now. Back at the turn of the century, the civilized world was moving from an agrarian society to an industrialized society. There were great conflicts and questions in this transition because earlier cultures of the Middle Ages and the agrarian society relied on things made by hand through individual craftsmanship and the, evol and the evolving industrial upheaval was creating a machine age. Modern architecture had its roots in this changing world. The thrust of the Bauhaus was an acceptance of and an adaptation to the machine age in architecture as well as in other art forms. It was the beginning of the emphasis on things and the decline of interest in people. Even in art during this period, we found the painters such as Leger turning out paintings of people that looked like they came out of a lathe machine. The Chirico making paintings without people of plazas, huge statues casting shadows, trains, things, factories, smokestacks, no people. It was an age when people were really not the main concern. It was an age of the machine. Modern architecture was the answer to the new age. Its goal was to cope with the machine and produce a meaningful architecture and produce a, an architectural environment for the industrialized society. Mass production was going to be harnessed for the good of mankind and produce an abundance for all of us. As this movement developed, and after World War II, the architectural schools, certainly in America, I can't speak for England, were belatedly and reluctantly shifting from the Beaux-Arts to the Bauhaus. I was in school during that wonderful and exciting time, immediately after World War II, from 45 to 50, a time when the schools were ahead of the practicing architects, with, of course, some very notable exceptions. We were groping with a philosophy of technology, machine craft, and scientific solutions, new building methods and materials. It was a time of adventure and enthusiasm as we envisioned a brave new world. For a time, it was an extreme triumph to get anything built that we called modern architecture. A time when the direction was clear and the goals obvious, not like now, or at least so it seemed. There were no doubts, only confidence in our quest. Personally, during school and through the 50s, I, like many others, was into Mies, Corbu, and Wright, the three giants 
with different approaches. I admired the detail and love of precision of Mies. I admired the plasticity and the invention of Corbu, and I admired the humanity of Wright's organic approach. I suppose self-consciously or subconsciously and intuitively, I was attempting to synthesize these influences in an attempt to discover my own way. I was fortunate to meet Frank Lloyd Wright in 1950. He turned me on to philosophy by saying, philosophy is a handmaiden of serious and meaningful architecture. Young man, go seek Emerson. From 50 to 53, I worked as a designer for a local firm and poured myself into philosophy in my free moments. In 53, upon receiving my license, I opened my own office alone with no work, 300 square feet, and I struggled for three years with small commissions, houses, schoolroom additions, remodeling, and I'm sure most of you know the story. And I discovered that in order to get people to employ you and entrust unto you to spend millions of dollars if it's a major project, uh, they've got to love you. And I couldn't find many people who loved you that much. <laughs> So I became very impatient with this process. And this frustration led to the architect as developer. It was really very simple. I came to the conclusion that if I came up with the idea, I obtained a site, designed the facility, handled the financing, that there'd be no question about who would be the architect. <laughs> so in order to accomplish that, I had to broaden my base of knowledge to include all of the elements involved in what I call the building birth cycle. From the time someone thinks of a, that something should be done in a certain place or or a site should be utilized in a certain way, all the way through to the completion. And to be conversant with that entire process, it was necessary to learn something about the mechanisms related to real estate, what made good real estate, what made bad real estate, how things were financed, what made something right to be accomplished at a certain time in a certain place, feasibility studies, market studies, financing of all types, long-term financing, short-term financing, construction financing, equity financing, and financial performance. All of these things that are related in getting a project done, historically, someone else has decided to build a project, has acquired a site, has worked out a program, and it's somewhere along the line, hey, we need an architect. And they go out, they hire some architect, and he comes in and he is given the site and the program and he has very little and no input and he proceeds to do his function and if the project goes along uh, and there comes a time when certain decisions have to be made financially or otherwise these people over here say you've got to cut this you've got to cut that you've got to do this you've got to do that 
and the architect does this and he does that because that's what the boss says. <clears throat> and that's, uh, uh, that's not necessarily in the best interest of the public because the architect is really trained in such a way that he understands the art and the culture and the meaning of what human life is all about, what society is all about, far beyond the mundane things or ordinary things uh, uh, which such as just making money or making a decision because it's going to save a certain amount of money at this particular point in time and that's the reason the decision is made. So if there are cuts to be made in the process who is better qualified if he understands the process to make those cuts and to hurt the final project the least better than the architect. The architect knows how to take the least out and leave the best and accomplish uh, this uh, uh, goal. But he's not in that position. He's in an order-taking position. This, as being an architect developer, places the architect in the proper role, a role which can really produce more for society, can produce a better product, at least I think so, than a developer who comes out from some other field with some other interest and he only has uh, one interest in mind and that's in strictly the monetary uh, results. And uh, that is the great uh, uh, advantage that an architect has if he's in a decision-making process, but only if he has prepared himself and is qualified throughout this process and he understands all the aspects of it so that he can make the decisions that in final analysis produce the best product. My first successful development came in 56 with the Atlanta Merchandise Mart. And there have been many since that time. Architecturally speaking, there was a parallel growth and, and interest uh, to grow architecturally and to grow from the aspect of getting something accomplished and something done. And to bring these two forces together was a constant and is still today a constant problem. I am very, very interested and primarily interested in the design and the creation and the creativity of architecture. I have done all these other things not because I enjoy them that much, but because it was a price to pay in order to get in the position to do the things that I wanted to do and to do meaningful and significant things. And not just to be doing something that somebody rang me up on the phone and asked me to do. Now that doesn't mean that we don't do things for people who ring us up on the phone and ask us to do things, <laughs> because we do. Sixty percent of, of our projects are probably self-initiated. The other 40 percent come in the traditional uh, architectural manner. Architecturally speaking, as the mart, which was the first major element in my development uh, as an architect and uh, as a developer, uh, as that building was being completed, uh, Brasilia was being dedicated. And uh, I was fortunate enough to go to Brasilia in 1961 
for the dedication of Brasilia. I approached Brasilia with great anticipation, tremendous enthusiasm. Here was the largest thing done in the world by world-renowned architects and planners, and I just couldn't wait to get there. And I uh, arrived in Brasilia, and I was never so shocked and disappointed in my life. And it was as if someone had thrown a bucket of ice water in my face because I began to see the failure of modern architecture. Here, the city, when they had wide open spaces and they had no restrictions, they had everything, with government financing and everything, and uh, what a dismal, inhuman environment. You didn't want to walk anywhere. And there was no desire to walk down the street and turn the corner and discover something new. You already knew what was down the street and around the corner because it was as if it was planned by giants with block buildings. It was the most sterile, uh, inhuman environment that I have ever witnessed. On the way back from Brasilia, this had such a profound effect upon my thinking that I began to question, you know, what, what, what are we really all about and this whole business of how could we turn out something like this? And I began to think in terms of architecture must have as its base and fundamental raison d'etre as a function and a purpose for human existence. And if it doesn't survive, if it can't exist as a beneficial effect on human life, then it shouldn't exist at all. So this brought into focus the fact that modern architecture as we had known it was so involved with the machine and the thing and uh, material and the structural systems and mechanical systems and how we can do these tricky things and all this because we now have them way to do it and we forgot about the little guy who's going to use it. We forgot about people and we built these things. We were involved in facades and materials and but we forgot about a human environment that people are going to not only look at and see, but going to experience and feel. After that trip, I made another trip, which was very, very significant, to Sweden, in Scandinavia. And I saw the satellite cities of Stockholm, Fallenby, and Farsta. While I was in the city square of Fallenby, I saw a woman pushing a baby carriage across a bridge spanning a freeway coming into the city center. The rapid transit system was underneath the city center. Everything was separated. And you saw children in the city. You don't see children in cities anymore. You don't see baby carriages. This seemed to be so humane that here was a pedestrian village and there were, the housing was laid out in such a way that people could stroll into the city square. I was very impressed by the planning and the humanity of it all. And then I went to Tapiola which is probably one of the best executed developments of its scale in, in the world today, architecturally speaking. But it didn't have the planning of, of uh, Vallenby. It was related to wheels. 
it was more campus-like. You still had, it, had to relate to wheels. So I came to the conclusion that if you could capture the planning aspects of Vallenby and the design excellence of Tapiola, bring these things together and create a new kind of human environment, that you would really be accomplishing something. And that if we could do a new environment that was scaled to human involvement, man on foot, a man in the United States will walk from seven to 10 minutes before he thinks of wheels. That's it. But given that limitation, if you walk from seven to 10 minutes and draw a radius, you would be amazed at what a tremendous area that would encompass. And within that radius, if it were properly planned in, in a way that would involve human life from every aspect, living, working, recreation, etc., we could have a more convenient, a more more human type of life, more serenity, more peaceful. We could do it, but our cities are not like that. Our cities are dispersed and fragmented, caused by the wheel. <clears throat> our cities grew up in the beginning with the first crossroads, and there was a one-story building at the crossroads, and it had a sidewalk and a street, and then it had a two and a three-story building, and then a four-story building, same sidewalk, same street, and then a 50-story building, same sidewalk, same street. The infrastructure never changed. The density grew and grew and grew. Resulting effect, dehumanization. No place for people. Today, Architecturally, we're facing an intellectual bankruptcy because we're suffering from misdirection, false illusion, no direction, every direction. We have architecture without philosophy. We have architecture as collage. We have architecture as stage set. We have architecture as parasite of historical form. We have architecture as whimsy, fantasy. We have architecture as form, not space. We have architecture as mannerism, architecture as pastiche, absurdity. We're like little lost Indians looking for a trail, any trail. But there is a trail and it's the best trail of all. If we can grasp it and capitalize on it. And that is, if we take what we have in our modern age with the technological progress, the scientific development, and we utilize that, but we put it in its proper context, and we put people first, and we make it the servant of the people, the servant of man. We reverse it all. That hasn't been done in the past. It's been the other way around. But we've got to put people first. We've got to think in terms of building buildings and environment that are concerned with people and all the people, not just a particular class of people. And in order to do that, we have to think what is a common denominator that strikes all the people. And the common denominator is that we are all creatures of nature. We all have innate responses to environmental conditions which we feel. And we've got to learn how to deal with that. We've got to take those human responses and how we feel towards architecture and towards spaces and towards environments 
And we've got to take from that and then build the physical thing around that in order to enhance the human existence. We can no longer go forward doing things and building cleverer things and hoping that the people will fit into them. That's the future. The future is humanity. We had the machine. Let's not discard it. It's great. But let's put it in its perspective. Let's take the machine and make it work for people. But let's really now look into the human aspects of what we're doing. And that's what the philosophy of our work has been all about. That's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to understand the human reaction to environmental conditions and to weave those things in to a physical create, creative solution. And with that, I'd like to uh, show you a few slides and hopefully uh, show you uh, uh, pictorially some of the things that might reveal some of the things I've been talking about. In 1979, the Museum of Modern Art put on a show which uh, included what had happened in modern architecture in the last 50 years up until that time, and it was entitled Transformations of Modern Architecture, in Modern Architecture. And what it was beginning to show was beginning to show the questioning not only of what we had come from, but what we were evolving into. This poster was a poster of the Renaissance Center in Detroit, uh, which was to express the transformations that were taking place. <clears throat> I'd like to start with Peachtree Center, which was the uh, beginning of uh, my career, and uh, give you some insight into some of the things that uh, we have been doing. What you see in red is uh, Peachtree Center as it exists today. We are now in 12 blocks uh, in the city. Uh, the big circle here uh, at the end of World War II was the end of the what they call the 100% district of the city. And uh, <clears throat> when we developed the mart, we decided to locate the new facility in this location, which was right next to the best part of the city. At the this is how it looked at that time. This was the building that was under construction. It was really a, uh, it's a wholesale shopping center, a merchandise mart. It's really a giant warehouse. Uh, concrete floors, concrete ceilings, uh, raw space, People set up showrooms and exhibits. While this was underway, uh, uh, all these areas you see in red, uh, we started doing a master planning for. And the uh, next slide uh, will show Peachtree Center as it exists today. Uh, we have managed to carry out a considerable amount uh, of this master plan. Uh, it's been what we call a private enterprise urban renewal program. There's not one, one uh, dollar of local, state, or federal funds involved in this uh, development. Today it uh, has a value of over three quarters of a billion and there's not one uh, cent of government aid involved. It's all been done on a private uh, basis and each building has been developed uh, even though it's part of a master plan it's been developed as a freestanding economic entity and it and it stands on its own when we finished the the mart which is in this location we discovered that uh, a wholesale merchandise mart brings buyers from uh, all over the southeastern region uh, an area comprising of 30 million people 
we found we were bringing 200,000 buyers a year. We had no place for them to stay. We had to figure out how we could build hotel rooms. And it was because of the mark that got us into the hotel business. So we went across the street, took an option on this land, because we knew we had this 200,000 people coming in right across the street. And uh, so that gave us a pretty good market to start with. And uh, uh, we designed the Regency, which uh, uh, has turned out to be the uh, sort of grandfather of the Atrium Hotels and uh, the beginning of the Hyatt uh, chain. And so we decided to explode the hotel, to open it up and create a tremendous uh, interior volume and a tremendous interior space which uh, uh, would give the feeling almost of a resort even though it's right in the heart and on the busiest street of the city. But to, to bring back into the city not only space but nature which most cities have run nature out. We've tried to bring all elements of nature back in because we are all creatures of nature and people of all walks in life and nationalities and whatnot all respond favorably to all forms of nature, whether it's flowers, fountains, trees, whatnot. So we need to bring that kind of element back in and that is a common denominator we shouldn't forget. <clears throat> so that was the basic uh, fundamental reason for the design of that hotel. We then proceeded to add offices, and we've added five office buildings. Uh, we now have in the center about a million and a half square feet of office space. Uh, we have uh, the Peachtree Plaza Hotel, which is a 1,200 room convention hotel, uh, which is uh, questionably the tallest hotel in the world because Detroit claims it and Atlanta claims it, so there's a quarrel there. But uh, we didn't start out to build the tallest hotel in the world, didn't have that idea at all in mind. What we started out to do was to create as much space at the base for people as we could. And because we only had 56,000 square feet of space, the only way we could do that was to go up in order to open up the bottom. And that's what led to the height. And it was not an ego trip, as a lot of people think. It's the, uh, the Mart, the, the, the Regency, and one of the office buildings. What we've also tried to do in the complex is to have a family of materials. Uh, the things that we admire most uh, uh, when we see old things, like uh, the city of Venice, is the commonality of materials. Uh, it's all the same materials, over and over. And uh, when you have a commonality of materials, the space becomes the most important thing and not the material. Uh, in our cities, uh, we have architects who are trying to outdo each other on every corner and they all have to use a different material and so we have a cacophony of, uh, of chaos which uh, uh, we don't have any, any, any really uh, harmony existing. What we tried to do here is that we took uh, the, the, the floor to floor uh, uh, level in, in the mart and the materials used in the mart and uh, we have tried to be honest to those materials and to those uh, uh, proportions throughout the complex. And that takes a lot of restraint over 20 something years uh, since that was really designed in 58. Uh, but what we're doing is building a family uh, of buildings, which really is one building. It's not a lot of different buildings and we're interested in the spaces inside and the spaces between and we're not interested in one building standing on its left foot and one standing on its head and being different things to different. We're not interested in, in uh, uh, having a particular building stand out so much as we're interested in the total environment. <clears throat> As you can see, we have bridges connecting and pinning buildings together because uh, we have found that uh, as tenants grow, they expand from one. 
and if they're trapped in the building and they can't expand, they have to move out, and sometimes they move way out. And uh, we found that uh, great advantage by having all these floors the same, and we can pin them together with uh, bridges like this. This is a bridge from, happens to be my office. This is a sunken garden, which is uh, about 100 feet off of Peachtree, which is uh, the major traffic artery. And uh, we've tried to create spaces of serenity. We've tried to create spaces of great vegetation. We use a lot of flowers, trees, all the things that you uh, don't expect to find in an urban condition. You can sit out at one of these tables. There are little uh, food shops all around where you can get a bottle of wine and, and some cheese and sit in a very quiet, serene atmosphere and you're 100 feet away from uh, all the traffic, but you're not aware of it. Uh, it's these kind of human experiences that we've tried to capitalize on. This happens to be one of the restaurants off of that uh, uh, main uh, uh, sunken courtyard. This is uh, a view as the city looks today, as the, this is the uh, the Regency, and within uh, 90 days, uh, we, uh, this was running at such a huge success, we, we uh, had to find an addition. We had to add an addition. It was 800 rooms. We, everybody wanted to add 200 more rooms real quick. So we had uh, a 50-foot piece of property adjoining, which was a little parking lot, and in order to add the 200 rooms, we had to design the facility to fit on a 50-foot width and so that's what created this cylindrical design in the first place and the core with uh, all of its service facilities and elevators became also the structure and it cantilevered out over the ballroom this is the ballroom here and uh, we were able to get the 200 rooms on a very min minimal land area uh, <clears throat> This uh, is the Regency. It's 22 stories uh, in height uh, uh, with a roof over it. It has a, a parasol that, that hangs from an eye in the sky, a sort of Pantheon dome, uh, 220 feet high. Uh, it's, like, it's designed like an umbrella with the, with the arm cut off and supported from the top. And it uh, hovers over this uh, cocktail lounge uh, to put the space in tension. And uh, this is a, a, a huge sculpture by Richard Lepole in the middle. And uh, the uh, area uh, creates a uh, sort of park-like setting or plaza-like setting with uh, a sidewalk cafe. And we have music and bands playing and other things there. This is a slide of the plaza, which shows a very small site. Uh, and uh, the market uh, uh, survey showed that in order for the hotel to succeed, it had to be at least uh, 1,200 rooms. And it became uh, quite a design problem to get 1,200 rooms on 56,000 square feet of land area and still open it up at the, at the base. And uh, that's... Uh, uh, how this uh, building evolved. This is the inside of the lobby of the plaza. And uh, here we've tried to bring back in uh, the feeling of space again. We have this huge open area at the base of the building with several areas, uh, floors open to public activity. Uh, we've created a lake with fountains and we've brought trees uh, back in. And the whole idea of of coming into a space uh, which uh, you don't expect to have in the heart of a city and creating a, a uh, human tranquility. Uh, this is one of the restaurants on the same level as the lake. Uh, we have a hundred and along the sidewalk we have a hundred and uh, fifty foot uh, uh, waterfall uh, with uh, a pool at the base the restaurant overlooks. And as you walk down the sidewalk, you hear this, uh, the sound of water. So 
a year-round swimming pool, which is on, on the top of the uh, public facilities. Rooftop restaurant, uh, which is, since this is the highest point in the city, it's a tourist uh, trap. This is uh, looking from the west, and the latest building that we've uh, finished is the apparel mart. The first building was this front section here, there are two sections here and here. We are the shopping center for, wholesale shopping center for 30 million people, which is one and a half times the size of Canada. So it's really a, a large market area. <clears throat> this is a exterior view of that, uh, of that building. The, it's all closed in because of the, in the first mark building, the the mortgage companies made us put the windows in uh, because they were afraid if it failed they couldn't use the building for any other purpose. By the time this building came, came along they weren't afraid of failing so they didn't make us put windows in. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the, the people in the showrooms did not want windows because daylight interferes with their uh, exhibition. Uh, and displays uh, and uh, how they want to use the interior space. So the tenants themselves do not want the windows and, and we, this is why the building looks the way it does. <clears throat> the building is designed uh, in the shape of a, of a theater because uh, it has a big atrium space but it steps back in such a way and it's, uh, it's formed in such a way that it creates a theater. And, uh, this uh, becomes the stage uh, and they put on these fashion shows and in all these levels as you come up uh, becomes a theater and you have thousands of people witnessing uh, fashion shows uh, occurring uh, in this area. We are now under an expansion program in Peachtree Center and uh, we're adding another uh, 1800 room hotel. Uh, Atlanta will become the number one convention city in the United States. Uh, we have the Hilton here with uh, 1,400 rooms. Uh, this will be a Marriott with 1,800 rooms. We have the Regency with 1,000 rooms, the Plaza, which has 1,200 rooms. The Regency is also going under another addition, which will take it up to 1,500 rooms. And there's another Marriott here of 800 rooms, low rise. But all these hotels are clustered together, and uh, so far, gigantic conventions, people walk, they don't ride cabs and commuter buses. And uh, so this, uh, with its climate and, uh, and the world's largest airport and a rapid transit system, which is due to open from the airport directly to the convention center with a station right in the heart of Peachtree Center, you can come from the plane to any of these hotels undercover uh, uh, in wintertime without ever putting on a top coat, without getting outside, go right all the way to your room. This is uh, a plan. Uh, we're into 12 blocks. Uh, we've, uh, this is the Regency. We've completed four office buildings in this block, an office building, two million square foot merchandise mart in this block, uh, a bus terminal parking facility in this block, a apparel mart in this block, the 1,200 room uh, Plaza Hotel in this block, and we now have under construction this hotel here, which uh, is a very unusual hotel. Uh, and uh, this is a, a development project with, uh, uh, that we're joint venturing with the Marriott Corporation. We are trying to carry out a family of buildings uh, in the master plan and the use of the materials and the forms and whatnot to create really a, a uh, as I said earlier, a, 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 a city that is harmonious. And uh, this is the, the building that is under construction at the moment, which is the 1800 room hotel. This is the design of that hotel, which is really very uh, uh, unusual, if I may say so. Uh, it's 50 stories, uh, small building. 
and uh, we have many um, uh, innovations in this building which hasn't been done before in a hotel uh, convention hotel area and that is that we have at the base of the building we really have a miniature convention center we have a people what we call a people level which is at the main plaza level which has seven restaurants uh, 1800 rooms we have a hotel within a hotel which is this is the lobby of the of the luxury hotel <laughs> uh, right here and uh, we have, in, in convention hotels, they normally, take, uh, uh, they normally take the suites and turn them into exhibit halls and mess up the furniture and everything. And uh, we came up with what we call a hospitality floor, which is this floor in the middle. Uh, we sort of like uh, the Coke bottle shape in Atlanta. And, <laughs> This is the plan at the main lobby level uh, with uh, restaurants uh, surrounding, uh, cocktail lounges, uh, sidewalk cafes, uh, and uh, we have a music stand here where we'll have uh, live orchestras and they'll be dancing in the lobby and, and it's, a, you know, it's a fun thing. This is just a uh, blow up of the plan which is cocktail lounge entrance to an Italian restaurant here, sidewalk cafe, uh, another restaurant in this location, one over here. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, looking up. We took the bridges from the elevator tower and they, instead of going straight out, they, they curve in fan-like fashions. And, create a, a, a very sculptural form, like huge wings going up, and uh, that's what it looks like uh, in the model. And as you can see, the, the, the top comes to a rectangle, and it's gradually stepping down into a parabolic form, and it becomes a very sculptural, uh, sculptural thing. This is looking at it from the bottom up to this uh, area here, which is the hospitality floor, uh, which is two stories in height, and all the elevators stop at that floor, and that's really where they, instead of in the suites, they have the exhibit areas. And uh, so it serves not only a functional requirement, but it also uh, creates our, our daylight need. That's the building from uh, from elevation. Barcadero Center in San Francisco, which probably comes closer to the coordinate unit than any other project that we've done uh, because it, uh, it includes uh, not only the central commercial core that we've been building, but it also includes housing. Uh, and this was the, the five block area that uh, uh, the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency put out for tender and uh, we were very fortunate to be selected as the developers. Uh, our partner was David Rockefeller, which didn't hurt. And <laughs> the, uh, the first building was this first office tower, 45 stories. It's uh, five blocks, four major office towers, and uh, a 800-room uh, 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 convention hotel. Uh, on a podium uh, which has 350,000 square feet of retail space, 
uh, with parking below. Now, the de we, we're, we're responding to density. Uh, density as you approach the center, central city makes a curve like this. But as I said earlier, the infrastructure has always remained the same. And what we've tried to do is to let the public space uh, expand along with the private space. All space breaks down into public and private space. The office, your office is a private space. Your hotel room is a private space. But when you leave that office or hotel room, hit the elevator and go down, you enter the public arena. And our cities have done nothing about the public arena. And what we've done in San Francisco and in Peachtree Center and, and in our other developments is to expand the public arena and to let the circulation tube from the private uh, space into the public space be just that. And once you get into the private, into the public arena, uh, we merchandise it and create spaces. In San Francisco, we created three levels. Uh, we had the street level, which we carried through throughout the whole project. We had an intermediate level, and we had what we call a podium level, uh, which was the garden level. And then above these levels uh, was when the private space uh, came into effect. This is uh, looking at the uh, uh, development. Uh, this is the podium level. This is the bridge going over one of the streets, which has been made wide enough to have tables and s places for people to sit. The podium level is, has all kinds of restaurants and shops, and so does the three, three main levels from the street up. And the private space starts up here at this location, in the, above the public arena. Another slide showing the San Francisco uh, uh, Plaza area. One of the bridges uh, that leads across from one block to the next, uh, uh, and the development has uh, over $2 million worth of commissioned sculpture. Uh, major pieces throughout the complex. Uh, this is a piece by Willie Gutman, the Swiss uh, sculptor. And uh, we have uh, 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 Nevelson and uh, Dubuffet and uh, uh, Nicholas Schaffer and the other blocks. This shows the three levels very clearly. This is the street level. We took the existing fabric of the city and brought it into the block. Uh, uh, and then uh, this is the intermediate level. And all of the elevators from the uh, uh, public space uh, start at the intermediate level, so you're forced to go through the complex by escalator or stair uh, in order to get to the private space. And then, of course, that's the podium level, which primarily is devoted to food and restaurants. The hotel, which uh, was the second uh, uh, phase in the development, uh, uh, and has been uh, probably the most successful financially hotel in uh, the history of American hotel business. It runs today uh, between 90 and 96 percent and has since uh, the bill, since it opened in 74. Uh, the interior was a sculpture by, 30-foot sculpture by uh, Charles Perry, huge atrium space. Uh, uh, capitalizing and also very concerned with how lighting uh, coupled with uh, the effects of solar heat are taken into consideration in these huge interior spaces. Another view of this uh, particular uh, hotel space and uh, one of the things about uh, we've uh, had some criticism and uh, that we turn our back on the city with some of these big interior spaces. We say, no, we don't turn our back on the city. We add another dimension to the city. We add uh, not only the exterior spaces, but we add a, a grand interior space, which is uh, adding a dimension, not turning one's back 
weather is not always good. Los Angeles, uh, they had uh, another urban renewal program here, which uh, was the Bunker Hill, and uh, uh, we uh, entered this uh, when they had the Arco Towers uh, built in this location, and the Union Bank here, and Security Pacific Bank uh, uh, in this location. Uh, they wanted us to come to this city and develop the upper hill of this development. We went into this, this city and decided that what really needed to happen was to take these isolated things that were already in existence and tie them together. And so we chose this site to develop the Los Angeles Bonaventure Hotel, which is a combination shopping complex and uh, a 1,500-room uh, convention hotel, uh, and began to knit the thing together as a, an overall environment and uh, become a complex instead of a bunch of isolated buildings. And uh, this was the site. Uh, this was the so-called World Trade Center with a freeway here, the uh, Security Pacific Bank, the Arco Towers here, the Union Bank over here. We were surrounded by these cereal box buildings and uh, we didn't want to do another cereal box. We wanted something that was in opposition and to complement those rectilinear masses, but at the same time to be the living room of the area and to tie uh, the whole area together uh, from a uh, people use point of, point of view. Consequently, we took a pedestrian bridge from the World Trade Center across the freeway, which came in at this level, and this established the public area. Uh, of this complex and the private area or the hotel rooms all started uh, from this point up. This is uh, the completed building with the bridge uh, shown coming from the Union Bank building in this case. Interior of the building here again, we, we, we try to bring in uh, daylight, interior space, a lot of planning. Uh, water, all features of nature which we find that, that uh, everybody responds to regardless of background or education. Renaissance Center in Detroit. Uh, we were asked by Henry Ford to come to Detroit to uh, uh, take this piece of land uh, which was next to the Ford Auditorium, the Detroit River, and the Jefferson Freeway, which is an 11-lane freeway. It's an isolated site. Uh, and to do something here, the city is across the street over in this area. So we had an isolated site to begin with. But to do something uh, that could have a catalytic effect on the growth of Detroit that would change the people's image of Detroit, but in addition to that, to change the the image of Detroiters about their own city, uh, and that was a very tall order. Uh, we came up with a design that uh, required four 40-story office buildings, a 70-story hotel, and 350,000 square feet of retail space, and 7,500 automobile parking facilities to be done all at one time. This. Uh, shocked Mr. Ford slightly, <clears throat> but uh, he uh, uh, got the automo automotive industry together in Detroit uh, and uh, everyone in the automotive industry, including General Motors, Chrysler, uh, Ford, uh, Autolite, uh, all of the tire companies and everybody that had anything to do with the industry, all participated in this project and, uh, and made it happen interior of this space here again, uh, water, uh, uh, lots of uh, nature, and we commission uh, uh, artists uh, f uh, from all over for all types of, uh, uh, of artworks, uh, tapestries, uh, sculpture, etc. It's a view of uh, that interior space, another view of the public space. 
one of the interior sidewalk cafes. In Times Square, which I'm sure everybody's probably heard about this one, uh, we uh, uh, have only been working on this for 10 years. Um, John Lindsay uh, came in 72 and asked us to come to Times Square when he was mayor and uh, the Broadway theater was going down. It was uh, really questionable that it would survive. Uh, the whole area had been taken over by uh, porno houses and uh, all kinds of uh, slum uh, developments. It was not a safe place. It was uh, uh, one of the biggest crime areas uh, in the city. And here again, we had a similar problem to Detroit. So we had to do something that was large enough, big enough to have a catalytic effect, uh, to be big enough to be a success in its own right, not depend on its next door neighbor because there was nothing to depend on. Uh, but also to be big enough and successful enough to where it would encourage others uh, to begin to uh, redevelop the west side of New York and the whole west side of New York uh, uh, which has been sort of cut off by uh, the slum area of Times Square. Uh, so there were a combination of forces going on. This was a key and this was a key. This is a, a wonderful uh, uh, convention center that's being done by Aim Pay. It's now under construction and uh, it's a $350 million convention center, which uh, is going to be one of the, probably the finest convention centers in the United States. And this uh, hotel is, the, is a 2,000 room hotel, which will be the major convention hotel of the city and the closest uh, to the convention center. The combination of these two west side forces uh, is creating now a another plan to redevelop 42nd Street uh, from uh, 7th Avenue to 8th Avenue, which will bring back the old traditional uh, theater district, uh, uh, 42nd Street. Uh, in the process of this uh, project, uh, we were not able to get it financed uh, uh, because just as we completed our work and uh, to give you some idea of what we do before we go to financial markets. We analyze and the market, and create the program, design the facility, and then we go through a, a process which we call design for pricing, not building, because we have to prove the economic viability of the project uh, quickly or as quickly and as efficiently as possible without taking great financial risk. And uh, by the time we got to the financial, uh, where it was proven and it was ready to go for the financial market, the city of New York itself was facing bankruptcy and so we were unable to get any of the financial institutions to finance this project, even though we had uh, over $40 million uh, in equity uh, uh, raised. Uh, and that's usually the last piece. In this case, it was the first piece. So in 74, we shelved the project. When Mayor Koch came in, he came back and he sent a team down and asked us to come back. Uh, that They now had the financing for the uh, convention center. The New York City's financing was now worked out. Uh, the city was getting healthy again. And uh, that they would help us uh, um, because they knew we were in a red line district and uh, that we wouldn't get uh, uh, the adequate financing. This had a very unusual structural thing that you might be interested in. I'll go very quickly. I know I've taken too much time. Uh, the major vertical structure in the two, two wings, and in order to open up the interior of the building, uh, we created integral five floor uh, structures which really form trusses that span between these two wings so there are no interior columns. Uh, this faces east and this is a large uh, skylight and you have these huge balconies which will have 40-foot trees, uh, 
tremendous landscaped areas throughout the interior of the space. We have tried to take the building and recognize the environment which it's in, and so we've uh, created sandboards and lighting and, and uh, the, the so-called Times Square image. Uh, instead of putting a, a, a more a dignified building, <laughs> we've tried to, in a dignified way, create a more carnival-like or Times Square image, but in a, in a, in a very a pleasant way. I, I, I'm going to run very quickly through some individual projects and not spend any time on them, really. Uh, Hyatt Regency it's in Chicago, O'Hare, uh, which is uh, a thousand room hotel. Uh, this uh, here again, uh, we'll just go through these slides uh, because I've used far too much time. These are individual uh, typical architectural client buildings. I was not the developer. This is uh, for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Insurance Company, a uh, major building in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Same here for the Fort Worth National Bank. Here, major called a sculptor. sculptor. interior of that bank building. We have our own interior department. We, we uh, are very, very concerned about interiors. Uh, we don't believe that an architect should stop his concern with the exterior of the building. We think that uh, you have to follow through all the way and make sure that the environment is complete and to turn it over to someone else to, to create an environment in a shell is incorrect. In Cairo, uh, this uh, project is on the Nile, looking across at the uh, pyramids, and uh, we have an 800-room hotel with two office towers and uh, uh, a thousand apartment units here. This is located between uh, downtown Cairo and uh, the suburb of Mahdi. Here we have a marina and we diverted the Nile. I mean, you know, who can divert the Nile? <laughs> we ran the Nile through the lobby of the hotel, <laughs> created an interior lake so that you can sail your boat through the lobby into the lake. Uh, this is uh, Jeddah uh, in Saudi Arabia. This is a pavilion hotel which opens this, mo uh, this month in Singapore for the Intercontinental. Uh, this is a very huge project in Singapore. That, uh, it's Marina Center. We're joint venture developers uh, with, on this project with the Singapore Land Development Company. Another view uh, of this uh, project showing the, uh, the, the hotels and the roof uh, top areas with tennis courts, swimming pools, and whatnot, all related to the private use of the hotels, but the public space is all below for uh, uh, everyone in Singapore. One of the hotels, another view of the Hong Kong Mandarin Hotel the Japanese hotel, the Tokyo. <clears throat> this is Hong Kong uh, in, in the new territories, uh, a thousand apartment units. Uh, they took the top of the mountain and, and they sliced it off like you'd slice bread and they put the land down and filled in below and then they left this huge cut at the bottom. And we just put the mountain top back by designing the, the building so it grows out of the mountain both ways. And uh, there's tremendous open space, even though this is a huge wall-like view, it's not really that way. And you look the other way and, uh, and then has this uh, tremendous open space. Additional housing in Hong Kong in the new territories. Another shot of the 
still Hong Kong. This is China. This is a hotel for Hang Chow, a uh, small hotel. Uh, here again, we've tried to uh, capture the feeling of the area and developing the, uh, uh, the hotel. And uh, this is a hotel for Shanghai. Uh, this is a house that doesn't look much like this right now, but this is a house on top of uh, a mountain in, uh, uh, in Hong Kong for Fung King Hay, and it sits on the highest point in Hong Kong. It's a wonderful, wonderful site. And uh, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, he says money is no object and materials anywhere is okay, and I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, a proposal for the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. and. Uh, we don't know whether this is going to, to come into being, but uh, the design of this is really a combination of uh, uh, a cross and a pyramid form, uh, which uh, is on a pedestal. Uh, and we've taken the events that happened during the presidential uh, administration, during the times, and tried to take those events and interpret them in a three-dimensional way uh, uh, instead of the typical presidential library where you have a showcase with a lot of photographs of people shaking hands and handing out pens. So it becomes an exhibit that's, that people can get into instead of a poster or something. Um, and that's the end of it.